Uh, oh, it is recording. It, it's recording. Um, yeah. Yes. Is it is sound coming out of here? No. No. Yeah, I think it is. Can you just mute? <laughs> okay. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Gaurav Chopra. Um, so Gaurav uh, did his uh, PhD at Stanford, where he got a PhD in uh, computational mathematics, and then he continued there as a postdoc uh, researching drug discovery, and then he moved on to a postdoc at UCSF, um, where he focused on immunology, and, and now he's at a Purdue, but I think you can agree he has like probably the, oh, oh, sorry, that's this one. Uh, oh, I see. He, uh, an ideal training for what he's about to talk about, which is AI and drug discovery targeting immunology. Uh, and, at, and you can also see that from his great success at Purdue, of course, published lots of papers, uh, also director of a center and uh, just uh, some really great work, which we're going privileged to hear about today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, I really appreciate coming here and meeting, meeting uh, old friends and making new ones. And thank you all for attending both on online as well as in person here. Um, since uh, this is a kind of a computational biology systems biology seminar, kind of I've tried to keep the biology, wet biology part a little bit on, on, the, on the minimal and wanted to focus more on the methodology side of things so that uh, you all can, can see how we view some of these things and what we do. Um, more importantly, uh, please do ask questions. In, in, in the middle, because I want to make sure if I'm going through it, it's at least understandable uh, for, 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 for things. So I'm going to talk about targeting immune cell dysfunction, and chronic inflammation. Uh, and, uh, and, and I will tell you a bit about my lab, what it does. But before that, no lab is without people. And I'm just wanting to make sure I acknowledge uh, the, the amazing group of uh, postdocs and graduate students and undergrads who work in the lab. Uh, and, and they are really passionate people working in these different areas, uh, which I'm going to kind of tell you about uh, a little bit as an introduction. I have to give some disclosures out. Uh, so as, as, uh, as David mentioned, I direct the Merck Purdue Center of Measurement Science. I have this relationship with Merck, which uh, funds uh, uh, a few of the projects, uh, which uh, part of it could be related in this, in this context. Uh, the, I consult for deciduous therapeutics and I have a, a, a startup uh, on, uh, on mental health uh, indications to develop molecules uh, and, and target them. Specifically, we take out addiction from molecules. That's kind of our goal. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, funding agencies have been kind enough to kind of fund our work. All right, so what my lab does is it comes into these four different subgroups. Uh, our bigger overall question is how do immune cells become dysfunctional in chronic inflammation, the title of the talk, but really specifically answering questions regarding to the intersection of kind of chemistry, immunology, and, and, and medicine. And what, what we go after is, uh, is developing a lot of computational and uh, machine learning methods and automation-based methods to kind of approach this problem in different contexts. But the I'm not going to talk about a lot of this. The only thing I'm going to talk about today is solid tumors and drug discovery out of all of these things. So, so, but I wanted to just kind of give this perspective of how these subgroups talk to each other, whether we, in terms of making molecules or looking at the biology of immune system in the brain and outside the brain and then developing single cell lipidomics techniques uh, for profiling cells, all answering this bigger question uh, and the models uh, thereof. So uh, with that, I can start with a basic introduction of what I mean by what kind of immune cells I'm talking about. So I'm talking about essentially two of these immune cells which have been a focus of the lab. One is called myeloid-derived suppressor cell or MDSCs, and the other is microglia, which is a, both are macrophage-like cells. One is in the brain, one is outside the brain. They only occur in chronic inflammation in, in diseases like cancer, uh, 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 neurodegeneration, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. The originations are different for these, these cell types, and, uh, but these cells do not uh, exist necessarily 
in, in normal settings. And there is a whole question, a bigger question around the field. What are those subtypes and, and, and subsets of these cells which occur in the brain in chronic inflammation, which uh, why we do a lot of kind of omics work and lipidomics work, which again, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but one of the areas of the lab is, is to do targeting of molecules. Now, the machine learning models or any of the automated methods we develop is related to a lot of targeting which we do in terms of choosing, in terms of designing, in terms of uh, identifying molecules with eventual goal of, of uh, uh, targeting them to specific cell types and subtypes. So typical drug discovery is done that you have a target, you find an inhibitor, and you kind of uh, 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 make sure that the molecules go into different tissues, different areas, and it goes to the region of interest. Here we are specifying the region of interest as a warhead based on that. And, and that, that is why we look at specific targets, one of them which I'm gonna tell you about today, an immune checkpoint or a break of the immune system. And, uh, and we make a lot of dyes and molecules to, to deliver in, in, in that context. So with that brief background in mind, right? I mean, I just wanna kind of introduce the part of the motivation of what, what uh, I'm gonna tell you about. How many people have heard of cancer immunotherapy? Okay, so that's, that's a number which is keep growing every, every time, which is good. So cancer immunotherapy is this idea of using your own immune system to treat cancer. Rather than treating the cancer directly, you treat the immune cells, which will eventually lead to a, a, a balance uh, of the immune system to, to either eat up the cancer, destroy the tumors, and so on and so forth. So the specific treatment options which existing for cancer, surgery, radiation, targeted drug therapy, has been there for some time. And immunotherapy is this new kid on the block, a newer kid on the block to some extent, right? with a 2018 Nobel Prize. Uh, given for something called immune checkpoints. This one of them is PD-1, the other is CTLA-4. And these immune checkpoint blockade therapy is, you can think of an immune system as a brake and an accelerator. So there are molecules which you press on and which inhibit the suppression of the immune system to, 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 uh, to, to treat the tumor or, or, or eradicate the tumor, which is a break, or an accelerator which can activate the immune cells to go and kill the tumors. What has been found over time that inhibiting the break has been better than pressing on the accelerator to a large extent. That's where immune checkpoint name comes in and the therapy related to that. So around 13% of the patient treated with this immune checkpoint blockade for solid tumors only respond to it and not uh, more than that. Uh, but this has been widely, widely useful and, 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 and successful in, in lymphomas and leukemias and melanoma and so on and so forth, right? But in solid tumors, there have been problems associated with a lot of problems are related to either bigger molecules or antibodies which are made, sometimes not able to cross the tumors. That's one of the reasons. The other aspect is, there are sometimes the tumor is so-called cold. What I mean by cold and hot is there are not enough immune cells inside the tumor to actually do the work which is needed. Or there are cells present which suppress them, right? And one of those cells, one of the markers why this does not work is myeloid-derived suppressor cells. This is one of the very big markers. So I'm going to just skip that introduction of what myeloid-derived suppressor cells are and just kind of tell you this, that what I've been trying to tell you is that the cancer or the myeloid-derived suppressor cells put the immune system to sleep. That's essentially what you got to know, nothing more. And there are molecules which engage with them to put them to sleep in, in this one. One of them is the PD-1, PDL one engagement, uh, which, which we will talk about. So essentially, given a tumor, given myeloid-derived suppressor cell, a very simplistic view is, that this engagement of checkpoint break, if you can inhibit that for which antibodies exist, right? You can, you can affect that. Can you make small molecules to inhibit that in a, in a, in a rational manner? 
can you make molecules to eradicate the protein, something called degradation of the protein, which we'll come to in a rational manner as well. And can you affect the function of these immune cells like myeloid-derived suppressor cell release a lot of molecules, which eventually affect the T cell function, something called nitrilation of T cell receptor and things like that by nitric oxide production and so on. So having this knowledge in mind, how can you go after designing molecules uh, to do that? So to answer some of these questions of affecting molecules and designing molecules and so on, which really cross the solid tumor blood brain, uh, so, 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 solid tumor boundary. Over time, we have been trying to kind of make a lot of tools, chemical tools, as well as machine learning methods on different areas of it, right? So both for modeling, drug design, machine learning, and chemical features, part of which I'm going to tell you today. And things about developing a lot of models on the library synthesis and reactivity of how you can actually take and even use machine learning for synthesis ultimately with on the cancer side a goal of developing these these cell targeted approaches uh, of doing things right now but I, I want you to remember right we we will talk about a specific problem but the model obviously as you, all of you know is very general to 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 to, to its use case so what we are going to talk about is uh, is related to uh, inhibiting this pd1 pdl1 interaction and that's negative means it's a break this is two cells of the immune system and you can say some of them are positive or accelerators some of them are breaks and there are a whole plethora of that existing of these protein protein interfaces which kind of come in and and, and work together to to to, uh, to 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 do things so um the whole field is wide open in this regard to really go and capture and identify these uh, uh, and disrupt these interfaces. So what will we do today is a way of really making models that can really differentiate, but that can really differentiate between the potency of highly similar molecules. What, what I mean by that is that molecules which are structurally very very similar, right? How do you go about that. I, I, I would rather focus on one or two stories. Like I said, I'm going to and not give you like a broad overview of things. And, and that's what we are going to talk about today is, is how do you find, how do you make models to even find uh, differences in molecules where there is even a small change as in carboxylic acid moving from one position, position to the other, which can affect potency of the molecule, which can affect uh, uh, actual response of the molecule, right? And then see if it actually works uh, on, the, on, on, on the in vivo side or ex vivo side from an immunological standpoint. The way of doing this is, is, uh, is we'll do with respect to modeling and with respect to using machine learning and a specific kind of graph neural networks, which I will explain. But the reason we are doing this is going back to that gatekeeper engager slide, if you remember, because I want to find molecules which are similar in potency if I can identify. That way I can identify sites on the molecule where I can add conjugates to make bifunctional linkers or mo and molecules thereof. That way I don't have to go through the whole step of doing structure activity relationship in that manner if I'm able to identify where I can make changes right, for very similar things so that I can use that then synthetically to do it. Um, any questions as far as where the goal is concerned? Okay, so the goal is clear. So the an example of this we did some time ago was more on the fluorescent side. So just to give everyone to the same page, this is essentially a molecule which glows under acidic pH. And we basically made modifications. The whole scaffold remained the same, but we just modified a small linker over here which can either target it to a nucleus, to a lysozymes, or to a mitochondria. Everything else is the same. So that is kind of the goal that you can attach things to it, right? And where you can attach so that you don't destroy the activity. Sounds good, right? What it does, what's the relation biologically, I'm happy to speak separately about that. How do we do it? How do we develop these models that differentiate potency for highly similar immunomodulators? 
right? We use uh, kind of uh, a, a guided modeling approach to do to do this. So this work uh, was really led by uh, Prageet and Krupal uh, uh, on on both uh, development of the model as well as uh, as well as uh, synthesis of the compounds, and then testing by a postdoc in the lab, Erin, and, uh, and, and then Jonathan was a previous graduate student who helped a little bit with modeling as well. In, and and so, so those are the major players essentially of this work. So the, the goal is to inhibit PD-1, PDL-1 interaction by small molecules. Now, uh, why small molecules? I tried to explain before, right? Because of antibodies and so on. There are amazingly, a lot of companies have already, already uh, invested a lot of effort in kind of making these small molecules. Uh, and there are patents which are out there for these small molecules which exist for, for the scaffolds they have. So we kind of, that was our, our data which we initially uh, tried to use in that manner. But even before that, we wanted to look at how PD-1 and PDL one So PDL one is, again, to remind you on cancer cells or on MDSCs or myeloid cells. PD-1 is on T cells. And that engagement we are trying to break, right? That binding site had interactions which really does not allow any molecule to come in, at least with the crystal structure which was known, right? So to inhibit PD-1, PDL one protein-protein interfaces, uh, and I was talking to Carlos as well about this, uh, we basically, and the field has gone that why not try to make molecules with dimerizers PDL1 in a homodimer rather than rather than inhibiting that, you're basically dimerizing PDL1 in that sense. And this has approach has worked very well at the same binding site, which is the same interactions with PD1, PDL1. So you are really kind of inhibiting the engagement both in the cell and in vivo of, of this to happen. Right. And the way we are doing this, like I said. Is, is a combination of these two. So I don't want to give introduction to neural networks here because David already told me that you all are very, very familiar with neural networks. So I will just, I will just tell you differences between, uh, between what is typical or traditional neural network and with graph neural networks and, 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 and how we approach the problem. As you know, neural networks, for others at least, uh, learn to perform tasks right, for examples which are there and, and, and for any programming, without any programming task specific rules to that, right, and, and essentially uh, the bigger question comes in, if you want to perform this task, you want to represent everything as numbers. So how do you represent molecules and molecular interaction as numbers, right, is one of the questions which comes in. Now, if it's a picture, everything you want to make a picture about is a is, is really a collection of color and intensity. And you can make really handsome folks from there using that picture, right? A fact of color and intensity, right? And if you, the same thing goes with language, right? There is a context of words and letters. When you write something on Google, there is a context of words and letters with recurrent neural networks, which goes in, which tells you what are the possibilities which would exist, right? Of the arrangement of words and letters, a training over a long time. But there is no really universal representation of molecules. One can argue, and OLS could, that okay, electrons are, and we should use any, but that's fine. But I don't want to model a cow quantum mechanically, right? The movement of a cow. So it's really very context dependent. And, and one of the methods or neural networks which allows for that is a context or concept of graph neural networks. Because unlike traditional neural networks, graph neural networks is able to identify the encoding or the representation of the molecules or the interactions based on the learning of the objective. So if my objective changes, my, my, my representation of the molecules will change. What I mean by that is, which we'll go in detail in a, in a minute, is that every uh, atom is a node, uh, every a bond is an edge if you take if you take that viewpoint. So you can really develop a graph of nodes and edges in there. And you know in your data set the topology of connections of, of those nodes and edges which are there, 
but you need to represent each of those nodes and edges and vertices as vectors, as some form of vectors. How long of a vector, right? How many of these should I consider? Should I consider only the friends of atoms, which are right next to each other, or friends of friends uh, in, in that manner? All of those are hyperparameters, which goes in into, in, in, into, into doing this. So as a basic concept, graph neural networks is a very good way of fulfilling your representation problem, right, to a large extent from given your objective. But there are a lot of caveats, and we'll kind of go through that as we go through this. One of the biggest caveat is, no matter how hard you try, you are still biasing your representation based on the starting point, right? And, and, and we'll, we'll come to that, and how do you deal with that? So what is our training data? Our training data was really scraping a whole lot of patent literature at the time. And essentially uh, developing uh, models from BMS company, Insight company, and BMS and Insight company together. And there are a whole lot right now which claim to inhibit protein-protein interactions, this PD-1, PDL-1 interactions. And you ask the question, if I look at all of that together and just use a very rudimentary Tanimoto score of similarity, right? I really cannot put a line and differentiate between these molecules. So I cannot say, at least based on structural similarity, there is, there is anything which I can say which is positive or negative. So it's a, it's a hard problem. It's a challenging problem from that perspective. Now, we develop a lot of uh, docking with dynamics methods as well. And I'm going to explain what that is in a minute, but a lot of docking energy functions are also not able to do this, right? So they suck big time and, and everybody knows that. And, but, uh, but the point is that it, it, it can be utilized with specific interactions, which are useful to, to combine with this piece of information. So rather than my representation of a molecule as only a graph structure, can I incorporate the graph structure of the molecule as well as the graph structure of interaction together to really find the best representation? That is the basic essence of what I'm going to talk about in this part of the talk. So yeah. Know you do know the interactions based on how we do it, and we'll, 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 we'll explain that. So, so there are high potency, low potency molecules. If you look at the molecules by themselves in individual patterns, you'll find that Inside has a bit more diverse, at least structurally, but the BMS molecules are very, very similar. Right? I'm going to skip this faster, but just for the audience who are not in this room, I just want to go through this. Uh, there is a way to do training validation splitting. You have all learned that. There is a way to do cross-validation, why we do cross-validation. There are different kinds of splits you can do to your data so that you don't overtrain. Right? whether you do random, stratified, i.e. the same distribution or scaffold split in this context, having different scaffolds as a skeletal scaffold. Right? All of that is good. You try to do avoid overfitting by cross-validation. Right, You do that and you try to develop your models and so on. And then you look at some certain performances. Those performances come in with test set, with your test data, apart from cross-validation. And you do area under the rock curve or, or uh, F1 score. Right. How many people have heard of this thing called Cohen Kappa? Yeah. How many people have heard of how many people have heard of F1 score? Right? Almost everyone. Right? And accuracy is another measure which, which, which is used. There is a problem with accuracy, which I'm sure all of you know as students. This is really for students, not for PIs, that you can get very good accuracy if you are wrong most of the time as well. Right, so that's 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 the reason kind of F1 score exists in that in that setup. Cohen Kappa is really a measure to ask how useful your models are or model is with respect to random. This is absolutely essential in machine learning, in my view. Any of the work we have done for developing models and then testing them experimentally has not really worked if we have not bootstrapped these models. So this is an idea of bootstrapping and statistics where, where I was saying, remember that you bias your model. How do I bias it? Because if I start with a representation, which I finally embed with my graph neural network, which I'll show you, right? 
I am starting with something and that is a representation, whether even if it's randomly generated, it's not random. There is nothing like truly random. So you need to have multiple models tell you the same thing. In other words, multiple raters saying what it means. And this is just a way of representation of that, that you can take how far your model is in, from a chance probability. And, 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 and uh, so you don't make one model or we don't make one model. We make hundreds of models and then we ask, just like if I give you a piece of text to, to learn from where you give your exams, right? You're not gonna all perform in the same way, but if let's say my talk here is understandable today, then if you give a test on it, most of you would actually converge on certain topics, right? Which, which you have learned. That's kind of the idea here to get the consensus or it's called ensemble learning. You can have many names you can put to it in, in that manner. Okay, any questions about this? Anything, um, I, I wanna kind of stop before I actually show you all the data and so on, because it, it, that's not my goal here. Um, uh, everybody understands if kappa is zero, it's random, one, it's perfect, right? But Really, in reality, you get around 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 0 0.5 or more. And these are very good models because this is not one model. These are multiple models. So you're looking at a distribution of performance rather than only one performance of a model. This is irrespective of doing cross-validation. This is irrespective of doing hyperparameter tuning. This is about asking the question, what is the chance my model is performing well? That is what it basically amounts to. And uh, there are some papers, one of this is there, what we have published on where we even have used small data sets, which distributions, which are with positive and negative distributions and, and not overtrained those data sets uh, because of this robustness of, 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 of bootstrapping. Okay, so that's one piece of it. So, so there is some machine learning we want to use. Why we want to use, I tried to explain because maybe it's a hard problem of similarity. <laughs> Right, but the other the other concept I want to kind of just make sure everyone is on the same page. If you're doing a lot of computational biology or biology, just working with numbers may not cut it. You need to have some physics inbuilt or some form of physics inbuilt into your models to, to, to get some aspect, even if it's approximate to some extent. The way we did this, and this kind of goes back to started from when I started doing my PhD, is we were making statistical potentials, and I'm gonna explain that a little bit, and, and scraping from data. At that time, we were not thinking machine learning or any of that stuff. Uh, but the idea is this is something we, uh, this is a code, all of the, the codes, by the way, I'm sorry, anything from my lab is all on GitHub, and, and you can all use those tools, so please feel free to. Uh, a paper should not be published if it's if it doesn't have a code attached to it. That's my view, and I think few of you share the same uh, in, in in that regard. Anyway, so given a given a binding site, given a interaction, what we do is we build a molecule atom by atom inside the binding pocket. So you start with atom. Each of these are like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on, and then you join them with maximum clique and eventually inc incorporate dynamics to use a star algorithm. Now, if some of you are not familiar with this, I'm happy to kind of tell you at the end. And uh, these are very uh, well-known algorithms in computer science, uh, which has been used to really incorporate in this manner. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that from those atoms, you can get fragments out based on your data sets Right, which is also called pharmacophore modeling in some cases. But here, at least, we try to incorporate the conformational entropy of each of the blue dot here is the position that fragment which is moving is taking in the inside the binding pocket. So you have some measure of, in quotes, conformational entropy incorporated in your model. Then when you have not only the blue points, but also the other points from other aspects of the molecules, kind of you incorporate that with a star algorithm and join these pieces with dynamics right so where you're where you're kind of binding and, and and molecules change so to your question david 
the particular statistical function we use uh, is based on features which I'll come to, but because we have resolution at the atomic or at the fragment level, we exactly know what all interactions are there, why we chose these points and not other points. A lot of details are in the papers, but I'm happy to kind of say if, if someone is interested about that, how exactly we do it. Right? So there's a lot of parameters there also, which were there in doing and developing this methodology. Even with I'm all of the- We are building, you know, molecules that we will never be able, to, that will not be in the time. So the, the question is, how do you know that you're building molecules which will not be synthesizable? So we have built in some basic rules here, uh, but we cannot claim to say that whatever molecule will may will be synthesizable today based on the expertise. That is one of the other things which a lot of you who do generative models already know. It's easy to generate molecules. It's hard to kind of find out which molecules to synthesize. And Underlying. Right, but there's some chemistry underlying that if it's a carbon carbon bond, if it's basically if it's if it's if it's an amine, there are chemistries existing to kind of conjugate an amines and things like that. But it's I thought you were docking a known molecule. So, the, but this same concept can be used to extend to design. That was the question. Just thanks for that clarification. But, but what you're going to talk about is you have a known set. And you're, and you're getting the interactions from using Candoc. You're getting the interactions from Candoc, but I'm saying we have expanded that in other projects to, to do design uh, with that same idea. But, but just by using this, we don't get uh, information, especially for very, very similar molecule by itself. It, the, the, I have a backup slide that, that the scoring interactions overall does not match up very well, right? But individually, they are very interesting. Okay, so what are these interactions we are talking about? Yes. Sorry, just to clear, it feels like what you're doing is like, you're actually talking fragments on the fragment side and taking like you said you're basically saying like it's statistical potential based on how regularly it's after a certain condition. So statistical, let me explain the statistical potential. I'll come back to what you're saying uh, in, in a minute. So kind of I'm a big Ludwig Boltzmann fan and everything we do kind of um, to some extent relates to that. And the statistical functions we are talking about are this potential of mean force, which is developed based on data sets. So we've developed a lot of tools regarding this. Lemon is one of them I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. But really the idea is that, that we identify features. These features can be distances between two atoms. These could be a collection of atoms, or these could be kind of whole amino acids with, with a particular atom or so on, right? And you, you, you do this calculation, which is on a data set of experimental structures in the protein data bank or in other experimental structures. And you ask, what is the probability of observing that feature, right? And, and, and the probability by chance that the feature would exist, that some of that log probability over multiple distances or multiple collection of features gives rise to entropy in quotes, multiply that by KT, or, or by T and you get, you get a, uh, an aspect of energy. You have all of those at different distances or different collection or whatever collective variable you have, and you can fit cubic and it explains to it to do differentiability and dynamics, right? So that's kind of the basic idea, which is kind of represented here as an example. The energy function created based on that mining is, let's say if you have aromatic carbons there and you're looking at the, the, the energy potential or you have uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen, you don't feed in that it's Van der Waals like or it's Coulombic right and so on. You extract that information based on data and what you get is very similar potential. Those models were right. Those those scientists were not were not, not talking through the head to a large extent, but 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 there are these kinks which you get. These kinks could be an aspect of other physics, which we have not modeled here, but the arrangement which is there in the structure, the arrangement of atoms corresponds to, 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 to kind of whatever physics and biology goes into those structures to a large extent, right? So that's kind of what we are capturing and mining out. So to your question, which you ask, if we are, do, if we are looking at fragments here, when we are looking at, when we, we are trying to ask the question at different parts of your region, you take, individual atoms, those atoms like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on, and you say, where all does it fit? 
right? Based on that fitting, you see where all collection of them makes fragments for the, the molecules in your data set or new molecules which you can design based on that, right? And then from there, you incorporate dynamics, but all of the energy function is based on, based on that statistical manner. Okay, and this is just a form of that. Essentially, this is one of the forms of the statistical one. In CANDOC, we have around 96 different scoring functions in that manner with different ways of how do you do chance probability, how do you incorporate a probability and things like that. Right? So all of that is incorporated in that sense. So essentially what one is doing is taking a molecule. You can think of this like having a radial distribution function, if any of you have remember or know that. Right? And, and, and incorporating that, all of the sphere of atoms together. So it becomes very specific to the problem based on a general data set, right? because you're looking at specific interactions of the problem at hand. Sounds good. Is that there something? What is the, the oh, you're generating? Is, is that 10 Armstrong, 15 Armstrong? Is that right, so we go up to 15 Armstrong. But uh, but that's really a limitation of the data set which we have, and if the data set has has values beyond that, we can incorporate. By the way, the, the way the method of the code is written, you can really put this out and even put an Annie in, if all as want, <laughs> and do it that way. But the whole point of doing this is is that you can you can incorporate atomic uh, uh, interaction based on a statistical potential. So. Uh, it's not only distance, like I was saying, right? These are different motifs which comes in. So we kind of made a tool some time ago to actually do that. We call it Lemon for multiple reasons uh, because of the sourness of dealing with all of these data. So, uh, but uh, but really the idea is that uh, that you can really traverse and get this from PDB or any other data set in a fraction of time. If you just look at about 150 or 170,000 structures today and try to ask the question how the atoms interactions are, are arranged, if you write a simple script, it will take you around six hours, maybe five or four hours now, which is a few years old, right? But if you use this particular methodology where we encode the information, which is already done by the PDB using this MMTA format, you can actually do it within minutes. So you can make C++ Lambda functions to do this, we have also have a Python wrapper to do this, to get both simple workflows as well as complex workflows. Complex meaning you can ask the question about dihedral angles, the frequency of those. You can ask the question about what selection of molecule you want and what next to the molecule, maybe a metal ion or, or, or so on you have. So in our docking method, we don't take out any of the um, uh, 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 cofactors, waters, or any of the interaction from the binding site. Just it's because we capture all those interactions and, and, and we have parameters for that because it's all statistical in that, which is based on, 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 on the data. Now, um, yes. Because sometimes water is unneeded, you can you know, slow water. Slow. Right, so, so the interactions which are captured, let's say if you're using a, um, a, a crystal structure, Whatever the experimentalists provide is what we are going with, but you are right that there might be some waters which are, which are omitted out. So we don't, we are not claiming to say that it works perfectly. We are saying that we incorporate those interactions which, which stay. The other, um, whatever the reason may be, that the crystallography remove that, or you don't have a good, um, good uh, 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 map of it. We don't resolve it. We don't do any of that uh, in at this time. No, we are just looking at structural waters. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, <laughs> all right. So from there, just kind of to skip this, I would just want to say there have been a lot of cases in docking methods which have been omitted, right? And we are able to capture those interactions in place uh, for. Uh, for a lot of cases like heme, complete heme molecules and the interaction. So this method is very good at identifying a pose, which is between like green and so, but it's very, very crappy at identifying, or not very crappy, but equally crappy at identifying the binding energy because that is 
uh, the hard part in, in that of overall binding energy, but the interaction ones works quite well. I can just skip this as well. We developed a lot of methods based on each class specific uh, uh, models to get the pose correctly. Why we wanted to do this? Because we really wanted the pose so that we can look at the interactions among that pose to incorporate into a model. Uh, this is another tool we developed. Uh, sorry, David, this is just a plug for what you said to include, <laughs> but this is another tool we developed, which is on top of Lemon called Dubs, and please go and check it out. There is a whole plethora of data sets. There is no standardization of any of the, of, 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 of the docking benchmarks and so on, and there are a lot of problems associated with it. And this really helps you within minutes generating your own benchmarking sets for whatever problem you are using because PDB is changing dynamically. Okay, so let's come back to our problem. So we have looked at at least modeling side, what we try to do, right? So what do we try to do on the, on the machine learning side? So we basically take local features, which we want to represent the molecule in code using the graph neural network and the global features together into, into these specific subgraphs on either side and essentially concatenate it, develop a model end -to, with end-to-end -end training and with bootstrapping in there. So that's essentially gives back with back propagation your, your, uh, your specific encoding of how these things are interrelated. In other words, how is the interaction energies interrelated with the, with the particular molecule at hand. So essentially you take, uh, uh, this is a general thing you can use for any, any receptor, but you take your particular molecule, you, you, uh, you represent your molecule as one over vertex over of, of your, uh, 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 your, 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 your sum of your vertices, which, you, which, which is there. And this is kind of just represented in this manner that a graph consists of nodes, which I mentioned and edges, right? So when you start first, you start with uh, a graph neural network, which is updating randomly with initialized vectors. So the initial vectors which you put in for each of these atoms are just random values. But like I said, there's nothing like random. This is why we do bootstrapping with, for end-to-end -end training. But when you start here, you have your updates which go in with respect to a neighborhood function Right? And you have to define that neighborhood function. That neighborhood function is not encoded. It's a neural network as well. So it obtains these molecular vectors. It learns the neural network parameters to give this potency. Right. So this is just kind of a reminder again. So this neighborhood function is nothing but to get the fingerprint of this, a vectorized fingerprint of the concatenated fragments, if you will. So. The hyperparameters in these models are the dimensionality of the, of the hidden molecular vectors, the subgraph radius, meaning should I take only my friends of atoms, one atom apart, or do I take friends of friends, two atom apart, or three atom apart, and so on, as well as the number of hidden layers in my, in my neural network to do the training. So just to, I'm not gonna go through unless you want me to what this means. I'm, I'm guessing everyone knows what this means in terms of what sigma means. Is there anyone who does not? Okay, so it's really uh, essentially this is a neural network which says that the edge at an update of the edge is related to the uh, uh, sorry the update of the vertex is related to the vertex plus a neural network of of neighborhood, and that neighborhood is the way it is set up is related to to the to the vertex as well as the edge. The edge is defined as as the edge itself between two atoms i and j as another neural network with, with uh, g being defined as where that edge is defined. Right? Now this is done on a whole data set where we know where the vertices and edges are there. right? So there, that, that way you start by random vectors, but then you train this along with con concatenating it. Right? You consider your whole molecule as a sum of this, all of this is recurrence here, as you can see, right? And you basically train that whole molecule with, with a X output, meaning your embedding of your in both your molecule as well as your as well as your energy with getting weights between when molecule and energy together are, are captured together. 
Does that make sense? So that that training is happening to get the embedding. That's the goal with both local and global features, right? And that is how it is set up. But you start with a no. No. You start with random vectors, but that vectors update. No, the KPG is a known binder. The, 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 the molecules. Oh, the molecules you start with are 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 from the training data, right? So it's all the same. You have known, unknown from it, right? right? But but I'm going to come to that. We synthesize these and what we do and what we do to test. I'm just kind of explaining what the method is as of now. So just to kind of update everyone, you basically represent each of the known inhibitors as the molecular vector based on connectivity of subgraphs. And then you represent molecular binding energy together. And essentially those molecular features gives you back the best representation of the molecule, right? Which, which, which is happening in, in this case. That's how the graph neural network is set up. So when you look at the test set, i.e. the blind data in the molecule, when the model tests, and these are bootstrap model testing, which I'm talking about, you see the kappa value for the data set, which was very diverse rather than very similar to each other, at least structurally, right? being very good kappa over 0.8. Remember, kappa over 0.4 was a fair value. When you look at F1 score, you can really not differentiate between things. So this is where robustness comes in, why using bootstrapping in machine learning is important because this model gives you better prediction, more robust prediction than random, which you will test experimentally. So we first tested prospectively or retrospectively with, with uh, already known data in the patent literature. And what we found that essentially, if you look at model trained on other set of scaffolds and inside patent, which was not the BMS patent, and tried to ask the question, how well does it work on the BMS patent? we found that it's kind of doing pretty well for both of the kinds of scaffolds which exist in the BMS pattern. Right? These are, this is just a kind of dioxo scaffold and, and, and a diphenyl scaffold, if you will. Both of those kinds of molecules, the model was behaving quite well in terms of giving true potency over half a softmax or so. But we don't consider just that softmax value, we consider a softmax value of a mean and standard deviation of 100 models, which we developed, right, to make the prediction. Looking at this, uh, the question being, is the e-gene in performance influenced by structure? Right? So when you look at this, again, this is all data set from the patent data. What you find is that there are cases where, where essentially the molecules, this blue means it's, it's all kind of a particular kind of scaffold. This, means there are these modifications which are made to these scaffolds. What you find, first of all, they are very similar to each other to a large extent for the most part, right? And, and, and the structures with high and low potency similar to each other is, is able to be differentiated. Like if I, in some cases, if I, this is probably not an example, I'll show you a synthetic one. If I, if I typically give a medicinal chemist some cases which are very similar, it's harder to identify which one is which one is potent or not, unless they already have a whole data set of structure activity relationships in, in their place. So to really test this, we really design molecules, and this is where the design part comes in. We design molecules which we wanted to synthesize so that we actually make them very similar to each other and have a negative control where things are not similar to that. So as you can see here, this, uh, this is very, very grainy, I'm sorry, but this molecule and this molecule only differs by the, the position of the carboxylic acid and nothing else, right? And what you will find experimentally, which I'll show you, that, that this is not active versus this is active in, in that sense, right? So similarly, there are these cases which exist where, where we do this and we designed basically a molecule based on incorporating both of these features into, into some. So we, we did not synthesize a whole lot, but we kind of made, made the choices based on similarity so that we look at the problem and we can have a similarity measure of the molecules which we wanted to synthesize, right, to, to, to test. So, so the, the, the uh, in, 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 in kind of in that manner. 
Any questions up until now? Yes. So you are what uh, Oles is talking about? Can you just use cheminformatic descriptors to try to make a model to to kind of differentiate that? We actually tried that, and over, overall on the structure, it does not work too well. So let me kind of remind you something I skipped over. The green line is the graph neural network. The the red line is the is the energy based graph neural network. So there is incorporation of some form of physics which is coming in. Yes, if you increase the number of descriptors and add more to it, you might be able to push that a little bit further. But this is a bootstrap model. But just based on just based on structure, you're not able to do that quite well, at least in this in this case. All right. So. So I understand here you predicted some of these were negative and some are positive. Yes. So these were predicted to be negative and positive, and uh, and and we picked some of the molecules which were already in the patent to say what our model predicts first, right? Which was not part of the training data and, and so on. So a lot of the training was done on scaffolds like this, and scaffolds like this was not included in in the training. So so essentially when we look at Remember the softmax I was telling you that bootstrapping gives you this measure of mean and standard deviation. We basically get uh, molecules like 4E versus or 4A versus uh, versus 4E, right? Giving you different potencies, 4A versus 4E, in this manner, right? And and this is this is really giving you that range. And what we have found is that with bootstrapping, then you can trust that 0.5 softmax cutoff limit rather than without it, right? So plus minus here gives you that limit over the 0.5, which will be more robust than just one model kind of saying that. Okay. So these are the model molecules which were, which were tested to be highly potent uh, and, and essentially we synthesized them. I'm gonna skip over that. Since I'm running over time, uh, uh, we basically synthesize these different different molecules. Uh, all of this is in the paper, right? And we then we did the validation uh, of of this, and the validation was done with something called an HTRF assay. This is just a very simple fluorescence assay in the biochemical setting first, where two proteins come together. One of them is PD1, the other one is PDL1, right? And you shine a light only when they are together. The particular uh, 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 light released from when they are together lights up the other fluorophore on 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 PDL1, for example. So if PDL1 has a fluorophore, uh, you shine a light with that wavelength. Only when PD and PD1 is together, the other fluorophore on P PD1 will be will, will be activated. So you would know that they are either together or they are apart. And the goal is. To, to that with the molecule, they, they should get apart, right? And that's what you see here, essentially, that with the positive and negative control, right? These kind of, these are just some of the testing. A lot of that is there in the paper. Like I said, I did not include too much aspect here, but the point is that, that with this first biochemical assay, one was able to identify between molecules which are, which have these changes Right in 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 position of carboxylic acid as well as finding a molecule which had uh, somewhat similar uh, potency to to a control. Right. The other thing is a lot of um, patents and papers I've seen which mention this HTRF assay and so on. They don't actually give any experimental description how to actually even do the calculations and so on. So the results are all over the place including the patterns to some extent, right? So there is some error there. So that's why we kind of gave a whole description of how you actually do uh, a, a calculation, which is which is instrument agnostic or experiment agnostic. So, are, are, are you showing the new scaffold? Because the new scaffold, it looks very similar. Oh, it is. It, and we are not claiming it's a new scaffold. We are saying it's very similar to existing one, but you are able to differentiate similarity based on this model. Kind of that's the, that's the idea. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, 
it says new scaffold in quotes it should be okay. it's new in a sense that it's really scaffold right, hopping right. yeah it's not there in the pattern but yeah but it's not new scaffold no okay so uh, remember i mentioned about about immunomodulation and on and how does this molecule affect interaction uh, of pd1 pdl1 so what we did is that we essentially had mice given ip tumors from those tumors, we extract the tumors and we extract MDSCs, these myeloid derived suppressor cells. So the ones which have PD PDL1 on them. And then there are mice in the lab which are called RAG knockout OT1 mice. What these mice are, they have defective T cells, but they only activate T cells when you put a specific antigen called OT1. So you take cells out of these, you add the antigen, and you co culture these two cells together. If you remember what I was telling you in the beginning of the talk, that MDSCs and cancer cell suppress the, the T cells using this PD1, PDL1 interaction. So essentially, the molecules should, should inhibit or affect that suppression. So that's kind of one functional assay one does to, to, to do that. So essentially, what we did and what we found that compared to vehicle at 100 nanomolar and 1 micromolar, and we have some in vivo data, which I'm not showing. For just for lack of time, we did this. We have went all the way into mice in vivo and also in dogs, which I don't have time to get into right now, right, uh, is, is what we did. But the point is, this model is useful to identify molecules which are very similar, to identify which sites you can change to have an effect. And we went ahead with that part, which I want to show you if you can give me two more minutes. How many people have heard of protein targeting chimeras or protax? Okay, so protax is this wonderful mechanism uh, uh, which was uh, determined by Craig Cruz at Yale to developing molecules to use the trash can mechanism of the cell. So what a cell does is when it does not need, when a protein expression goes too much high or dysregulated, right, there are E3 and other ligases, there are ligases in the cell which goes and binds to these proteins and put ubiquitin tags. And that ubiquitin tags on the protein is a, is a flag to tell the cell to destroy that protein. And it basically destroys that in the proteasome. That's how you degrade proteins. So one is an inhibition concept, the other is a degrade, degradation concept. So here you degrade. A lot of antigen presentation in the immune system also uses this mechanism. To, to happen. So when people say that there is an antigen presentation on cells, that's what is happening, that the peptides are, which are presented are actually degraded by one of these mechanisms. What Craig Cruz did was that basically figured out that can you bring in the protein of interest towards the particular ligase both together so that now you can put ubiquitin tags on them. And you can destroy protein of your choice. And those that mechanism, that molecules are called protax. There's another jargon in the field called molecular glues. You don't have to worry about it. Works by the same mechanism. The idea is that this typically works for intracellular proteins. Right? This mechanism was typically for intracellular proteins. The PDL1, which I was talking about, are proteins on the surface. They obviously go inside, but they are on the surface of the cells. So when we develop this model, we ask the question, can we now identify taking these similar molecules, sites which we can synthetically modify, but which of those sites we can should modify, right? To, to using this model to add linkers to it. This work was done by Ahad and Raylan. Ahad doing the synthesis of the protax, Raylan doing the testing, and Pragit's original model was used, which Sanya has taken over, to change for protax. So this is a very new thing rather than showing you in vivo data and we do very well. I want to kind of, kind of at least show you this part. Specifically, making another point, which was point about controls. So when you do computational modeling, it is very, very important to do controls. This is my molecule without the, without the linker, which I have chosen. This is the molecule with the linker, which I have chosen, uh, which linker, which will connect to the, to the molecule, which binds the E3 ligase together. As a control, the interactions should be similar between these two molecules if I want the molecule to behave similarly, right? Obviously, I chose this based on the graph neural network, so I know that those similar molecules' potency would not change too much. 
right? That was the idea of making the network. But when you actually see this, and I'm just showing you this movie, essentially the interactions of both of them, this is just showing interactions, are very similar. In other words, it does not affect the protein-protein interaction with the, with the molecule in place. When you actually do the experiment, this experiment is taking cancer cells, which express a lot of PDL1, and asking the question: if I add these molecules which degrade PDL1 on the surface, do I see a reduction in PDL1? It's a flow cytometry experiment which was done to do that. We are doing Western blots and so on on it. And what you find is that even if you chose similar molecules from your model, some of them give very good result, but the differential potency, even within PROTAC, having the same linker does not give you same specificity, meaning it's not able to degrade PDL1 in that manner, which is very interesting. It's not, it's, it's not saying that, that, oh, because this molecule binds very strongly, I should be able to degrade it. I'm saying that may be very different. Another model is needed and people have gone looking at new linkers, but I'm saying these are the same linkers, but different potency of the molecule, right? Which, which we, have, we have done here. So, and people have made models to find new linkers and so on to affect that, but uh, at least in general case. But, but, but the idea here is that, that that part of just identifying similar molecules for potency is not enough necessarily to kind of do that because my expectation was that all of these three should behave very similarly based on the model, but it did not. Only one of them did, which we have a molecule and we are going in vivo and so on for it, but it did not. And we are targeting the dimer. Targeting the dimer. You are bringing the dimer for degradation. We are, no, we are bringing the PDL1 dimer for degradation. Exactly. Yes. We are bringing the PDL dimer for degradation. Right. I right. think this is the first time I see a, a, a product that actually. Because it's on the cell the surface. Dimer. Yes. Typically, you just bring one. Yeah, because it's typically intracellular. Yeah, right. So, but I'm saying that even after that, it's not, it's not. Uh, the models are not enough to kind of say that, but it's but at least it's a good start where we are able to identify what molecules to choose. We got this by chance, I would say, because I expected all three of them to work <laughs> based on the model, right? So, yeah. so anyway, so uh, let me just uh, uh, summarize here. Uh, we are doing a lot of automation work of closed loop automation and so on with NCAS. I don't need to get into that um, per se, but uh, uh, let me yeah. just summarize. Right, that's the reason for it. So, to, so I hope uh, um, I've tried to kind of give you some perspective of what we are doing with respect to bootstrapping being essential for a reliable model. Physical model and interpretable models are very, very effective and can really guide, not only guide SAR, but in specific context, tell you what changes to make and, and really differentiate between highly similar molecules. Obviously, we have a very specific use case we use this for, right? There's a lot, lot of other models uh, re with respect to generative models and so on and recurrent neural networks we have used. There's a whole area we have basically explored with Merck on, on something called drug development, which is not drug discovery, right? Which I'm not kind of mentioning, but these are kind of some of the things which are done on automating uh, HPLC and things like that, and they use evolutionary algorithms where the math is wonderful and cooler. But I hope I gave you this, this perspective with one example, my hope is which was understandable rather than coming in and talking generally. So please, I want some questions. Even if you have none, kind of make one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're over time, but if there's a few quick questions, we can ask a lot. Maybe a student would like to ask a question. We'll get an extra cookie. You're not a student. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're all the, the new person. Okay. Here's a student. Okay. So when you're combining the graph neural network with the global features of like your binding interaction, what type of, what are you using to get those global features? Is it just like the output of some other model or? No, those, those features are the ones, uh, uh, in this case, these were distances between, but we have explored even collection of atoms. Like I was talking about the features, how we incorporate 
between uh, multiple atoms and one atom as a statistical feature. So those individual interactions are put in and concatenated as vectors, the energies of those interactions. But what I'm trying to say is, if you calculate as a simple sum of all those energies, which is right, which is obviously known, the overall energy is not correlative to affinity. Go ahead. So you start talking about solid principles. Solid right? tumors, right? And yeah, uh, but uh, where where is the the emphasis on solid? Right. So the uh, the 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 BT and the MB forty nine. These are bladder cancer and oh, breast cancer cell lines. Cancer. But uh, yeah. like I said, I didn't want to go there. But we have taken this, and uh, I don't know if I can. We have taken this um, in vivo, specifically finding molecules for MDSCs. And uh, and that uh, I didn't want to show this, but I can. I did in vivo testing with uh, with mice given solid tumors, and essentially the molecule not affecting the cancer. I'm not talking about the degrader. I'm talking about the inhibitors not affecting the cancer, but actually affecting uh, the tumors in vivo because it's affecting the immune cells. There's a lot of immunology associated with it. We kind of went and characterized that. I didn't want to bore you with all of that, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk separately. Okay, we are over. No, okay. <laughs> Not very serious, of course. What's